Hi, this is Dr. Ginger Campbell, host of Brain Science. I hope you will join me for my induction into the Podcast Hall of Fame on March 25th, 2022. You can attend for free, either online or live in Los Angeles. To learn more, please visit brainsciencepodcast.com or email me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. Welcome to Brain Science, the podcast that explores how recent discoveries in neuroscience are unraveling the mystery of how our brain makes us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 193. You can find additional episodes of Brain Science, show notes, and episode transcripts at brainsciencepodcast.com. Please send feedback to brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. Today's episode was inspired by the book, Out of the Cave, A Natural History of Mind and Knowing by Mark Johnson and Don Tucker. But especially for the sake of new listeners, I will mention that this episode is unusual. It is not an interview or a direct discussion of the book. It's more of a big picture episode that asks, what does it mean to say that the mind is embodied? And why does this matter? I try to make all episodes of Brain Science accessible to new listeners, but this one might be a hard place to start. Please do give it a chance. But if you feel overwhelmed, go back to last month's interview with Nina Krauss. It's a great starter episode. If you are a longtime brain science fan, the idea that the mind is embodied will be familiar. But we haven't really talked about why this matters. So that's what we're going to talk about this month. That's the reason why this episode is a little shorter than usual. What does it mean to claim that the mind is embodied? It means that the mind is a natural process of a brain within a body interacting with its environment. Discovering that the mind is embodied means that there are no eternal forms or unchanging essences. It acknowledges that there's nothing permanent and unchanging. There's no permanent unchanging source of knowledge. Knowledge is is embodied just like the mind. It results from interaction with the world, which is obviously constantly changing. Let's contrast this with the disembodied view. In the disembodied view, the mind is not just non-physical, but it also includes the idea that it is fixed and pre-existing. It is implied that the mind is equal to the self and that the self or the mind exists prior to any acts of knowing. The mind is supposed to take perceptions and generate representations of an objective mind-independent world. Now, this idea of a disembodied mind is deeply entrenched in both Western and Eastern thought. In the past on brain science, we've talked about why we seem to be natural dualists, which means thinking that the mind is non-physical. Neuroscientist Michael Graziano probably put it best when he observed that the brain gives us a cartoon version of reality, and it doesn't need to tell us what it's up to, since that is not important to our survival. So we naturally have this intuition or feeling that our thinking mind is something non-physical. Now, this idea of the disembodied mind goes back to before Plato and has followed up all the way through modern analytic philosophy. In psychology, it is epitomized by behaviorism where the mind is just treated like a black box. First-generation cognitive science emerged from these traditions along with the computer metaphor, which is definitely a disembodied approach. So let's consider how this disembodied approach has influenced cognitive science. Most obviously, there's this mind as a computer metaphor. What does this mean? It means thinking that the mind is working like a language, that it's taking 
perceptions and organizing them into these sense-like propositions that are supposed to represent an objective mind independent world. According to Lawrence Shapiro in the second edition of his book, Embodied Cognition, standard cognitive science is committed to the idea that cognition involves algorithmic processes using symbolic representations. In other words, that it's working something like a computer program. Embodied cognition is an alternative approach. And we've actually discussed this in the past, but according to Shapiro, there are three key themes to the embodied cognition approach. One is that the properties of an organism's body limit or constrain the concepts it can acquire. Second, the standard computational approach should be replaced by a recognition that cognitive processes are not discrete, but continuous. This means that tools like dynamic systems theory are more appropriate, and the body's interaction with the environment replaces the need for the representational processes assumed to be at the core of cognition. The third theme of embodied cognition is that the body or world plays a constitutive role rather than a merely causal role in cognitive processing. To say that the body is a constituent of cognition is to say that it's like oxygen is a constituent of water instead of a causal role, which be like oxygen as a cause of an explosion. In this embodied approach, conceptualization and reasoning are based on the same sensory, motor, and affective processes as perception and action. This is supported by current neuroscience. It's also consistent with predictive models of brain function. In this approach, these predictions are knowing and knowledge. That's why I would say that animals can have knowledge even though they don't have language. Go to the show notes at brainsciencepodcast.com for a full list of previous episodes where we have discussed embodied cognition. Now, cognitive linguistics is a subset of embodied cognition, which we touched on with Benjamin Bergen back in episode 94. This is an alternative to the language-first approach that was proposed by Chomsky and assumed by the first generation of cognitive neuroscientists. The cognitive linguistic approach is based on the evidence that conceptualization, reasoning, and linguistic acts are based on pre-existing capacities for perception, bodily movement, object manipulation, and emotional responses. One of the key elements of this evidence is the fact that there is not a separate part of the brain for these things, that they all seem to use the same parts of the brain. A key premise of cognitive linguistics is that our thinking is innately metaphoric, which is to say ideas such as up versus down are based on our embodied experience and came before language. The ubiquitous use of metaphors across languages reflects this embodied inheritance. The key idea is that Thinking and cognition precede language. Language enhances both our ability to communicate and our ability to think, but it did not come first as is traditionally assumed. This may seem obvious to younger listeners who have grown up with the overwhelming evidence that non-human animals and non-verbal humans can be intelligent, but the data for this has only emerged in the last 50 years or so. That's nothing compared to the thousands of years that it has been assumed that reason is a disembodied gift that only humans enjoy. I was going to say it's a drop in the bucket, but that is a good example of the metaphoric language that we use all the time. I'm going to take a break here to welcome back one of my favorite sponsors, Green Chef the number one meal kit for eating well. Green Chef provides high-quality organic ingredients so you can prepare healthy home-cooked meals even when you don't have time to shop. 
There are a lot of meal kits out there, but only Green Chef gives you the ability to choose everything from keto to vegetarian. Plus, you can change whenever you want. Green Chef has the only keto meal option on the market. I love the variety of Green Chef, and it really comes in handy when you want to entertain on short notice. When I got the news about being chosen for the Podcast Hall of Fame, I was able to celebrate with a friend, even though we didn't feel like going out. Green Chef is owned by HelloFresh, and with a wider range of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. I love switching between the brands, and now my listeners can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. Just go to greenchef.com forward slash ginger130 and use the code ginger130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. That's greenchef.com forward slash G-I-N-G-E-R 130 promo code G-I-N-G-E-R 130. From a philosophical standpoint, realizing that mind is embodied leads to a reevaluation of the meaning of knowledge. We have to go beyond Plato's perfect world of ideas. Kant recognized that our understanding is influenced by our physical nature, but he still believed that there was a non-physical mind that could access a deeper reality. Obviously, we've got to move past Plato's claim that there's some non-material place where ideas exist in a pure or perfect form. I never found this claim appealing, but historically it has been a powerful idea that was indirectly promoted when Christianity ruled the Western world. But remember, these same ideas are found in the East. If the mind is embodied, so is knowledge. But what does that mean? It means that knowing is also an embodied experience. Some of you may remember Gibson's idea of affordances. The idea of affordances encompasses the fact that we experience the world not just through our bodies, but in terms of our body's relationship to the objects in the world. As a human, you perceive some horizontal surfaces as places to sit, but a bird will see the world in terms of where it can perch. When I first heard this idea about affordances, I reflected on the fact that if a scientist enters a lab, she may see various instruments as meaningful tools, but a non-scientist may see only flashing lights. The discovery that knowledge is embodied means that it is inevitably a subjective experience. We can never achieve that goal of pristine objective knowledge. This fact emphasizes why we need the scientific method as a way to overcome our innate bias and subjectivity. Of course, it must also be recognized that many scientists also cling to this hope of pristine objective knowledge. I like to think of science using the famous story of the blind men touching an elephant and giving contradictory accounts. Think of science as a way of not only testing and confirming their reports, but also as a way of trying to create a unified picture. So the more places on the elephant that get sampled, so to speak, the more accurate the picture of the elephant will become. But let's say that we had this picture of an elephant that did not include the trunk, and all of a sudden someone touched the trunk for the first time there would probably be suspicion and disbelief until others also touched the trunk and confirmed the finding. So that's the way science works. So let's review some of the key ideas. Based on current neuroscience, we are beginning to appreciate that the function we call mind is entirely dependent on a brain within a physical body. Many non-human animals demonstrate evidence of mind, cognition, and intelligent behavior. Some scientists even argue that these animals are conscious, but that is much harder to prove. The key idea is that mind is a naturally occurring embodied process. It does not require anything supernatural or non-physical. 
when we start to explore the implications of this discovery, we realize that it challenges many deeply ingrained assumptions about human nature. Not only do we come to appreciate the subjective nature of our own knowledge, but we also realize that there's no significant gap between us and the other living beings on this earth. We are all utterly dependent on our bodies and our environment to enjoy this experience that we call life. The more neuroscientists explore the brains of both humans and non-humans, the more we appreciate that our abilities are built on those of our vertebrate mammal and primate ancestors. Cognition or decision-making has its roots in embodiment and the need to survive. Prediction and error correction are examples of tools we share with these other animals. This is one reason why I insist that non-humans are capable of both cognition and intelligence. We've also discussed that most of what our brain does is below our conscious awareness, and it is reasonable to assume that this is true for other animals. Language allows us to communicate and to think more complexly, but it did not come first. It is a relative newcomer. We aren't even sure when it actually emerged, but we can see that our primate cousins are capable of surprising feats of intelligence, and even dogs are much smarter than we once realized. Some people see science only as a path to creating technology. But I agree with those who argue that it remains our best tool for overcoming our innate bias and subjectivity. It should be a tool for uniting people, despite recent attempts to do the opposite. I want to take a moment to mention our longtime sponsor, Text Expander. What can you do with more hours every month? Repetitive typing, little mistakes, searching for answers. They're all taking away precious time. With Text Expander, you can take that time back so you can focus on what matters the most. You just type a few characters to trigger your snippet, and the content expands wherever you type. It's that easy. If you want to learn more about how to use Text Expander, you can go to textexpander.com forward slash blog. I literally use Text Expander every day, and I really appreciate that Text Expander is available on Mac, Windows, Chrome, iPhone, and iPad. Brain Science listeners get 20% off their first year. Just visit TextExpander.com forward slash podcast to learn more. That's TextExpander.com forward slash podcast to learn more and get 20% off your first year. And don't forget to tell them that you learned about it on Brain Science. I want to thank you for joining me for today's thought-provoking discussion. I know some of you are going to be unhappy about the length of the episode, wanting it to be longer. Believe it or not, this episode started out to be about two hours long, and I have actually worked really hard to pare it down to these key ideas so that you can really digest them. But I'd love to hear what you think. Just email me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com and visit the website Brain Science Podcast for complete show notes and episode transcripts. While you're there, you can sign up for the free Brain Science newsletter so that you can get show notes automatically every month. You also get my free handout, Five Things You Need to Know About Your Brain. To get the newsletter, you can also text the word brain science, all one word, to 55444 to get the newsletter. That's brain science, all one word, to 55444. The Podcast Hall of Fame is podcast's most exclusive honor, so I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has supported my work since I started podcasting in 2006. I hope you will join me for my induction into the Hall of Fame on March 25th, 2022. You can attend for free either online or live in Los Angeles. If you're going to be in Los Angeles and want to attend in person, please email me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com so we can get together. To be honest, the Hall of Fame announcement caught me by surprise, but fortunately, the redesign of our website at brainsciencepodcast.com is almost complete. 
If you're an educator, I hope you'll visit the new page I've added for teachers and educators and let me know what you think. The redesigned website also includes what I hope is clear information about how you can support the show financially. You can learn more at brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. Thanks again for listening. I look forward to talking with you again next month. Brain Science is copyrighted by Virginia Campbell, MD. You may share the show with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please write to brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com for permission. The theme music for Brain Science is Mind Fire, written and performed by Tony Catraccia. You can find his work at syncopationnow.com.